Morning all. I thought it would be nice to have a look at one of the most famous correspondence games ever played. And it's between two players who both earned the title of ICCF World Champion. ICCF is the International Correspondence Federation. Both these players were very strong over the board players as well as correspondents, both having IM titles. Player with the white pieces in this game is Yakov Estrin from the Soviet Union. Now, um, Estrin uh, is the seventh ICCF world champion between 1972 to 76. Um, he became an international correspondence grandmaster in 1966, just a year after this game. And he would go on to compete in the final of the World Correspondence Championship five times. And um, okay, he was awarded the IM title in 1975. He wrote several chess books and was an authority on the two knights defense. And that's relevant for this game. So it was very, very well known to his opponent, who was Hans Berliner, that he was an expert in the two knights defense. So Berliner, the story behind this game, Berliner had a few months to prepare. Uh, against the two knights defense and um, but before going into that let's talk about Hans Berliner he was the fifth ICCF world champion between 1965 and 1968 and this is actually a game from the correspondence uh, world championship the fifth one in 1965 from the US a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University uh, so a grandmaster of correspondence chess, an international master for over the board chess, and he, interestingly, he directed the construction of the computer high tech. He's also a chess writer, and um, he's had some amazing, amazing feats in correspondence chess. But this is one of the most important games we're about to see. Okay, so let's go into it. So. As expected, Yakov Estrin, he plays e4. After e5, we see knight f3. We'll use the two pass approach for this game, especially important for this game. Get a little brief overview in the first pass, then go trying to go into a little bit more detail in the second pass. But there's been a huge amount of analysis on this game. Um, so don't expect too much from the second pass. So knight c6, and we see bishop c4. And the two knights defense knight f6, which is encouraging the fly, fried liver attack, very famous fried liver attack with knight g5. Now, black plays here something which in blitz I found quite a crushing weapon. d5 first after e takes d. Uh, I used to play knight a5 myself, but this, this other move is a very, very interesting alternative now. So if you're playing black in this version you might like this game quite a bit as an antidote potential antidote or weapon of choice against the fried liver it's to play b5 here now one note about this it's it can be disastrous for white to play taking on b5 uh, you know queen takes d5 and this this diagonal down here it's, it's very nice for black sometimes now this next move is designed to make it quite uncomfortable uh, for black whatever he does in regards to taking on d5. White plays actually a seemingly paradoxical move which you might think is a bit crazy breaking rules of development <laughs> but the bishop just goes home now it goes to f1 but it's very very theoretical. So one point for example if queen takes then knight c3 and you know the bishop's guarding g2 there so that's just gaining tempo with development so the paradox of it is is kind of justified in that simple example and on knight takes d5 well we should really look at in the second pass of the game but knight takes d5 also has a good move for white so um but uh wait for the technical more technical details in the second pass black plays here knight d4 Okay, so Hans Berliner, he he prepared all this. He's, he's got a nasty shock 
for white coming up. We see now c3 and black uh, doesn't want to move this knight just yet. He plays actually knight takes d5 uncovering an attack on the knight here. Okay and white really doesn't want to take on d4 here. Queen g5 I, I assume queen takes g5 is absolutely okay for black. So white played knight e4. Okay does this knight want to go back? Well this pawn's also loose so that might not be a good idea but we need detailed analysis to see exactly what's going on. I assume it's to do with b5 that the knight doesn't want to retreat. Instead we see queen h4 again attacking a piece in return. The knight now goes to g3 and is black ever going to move the knight on d4 you might ask. So um, Hans Berliner's next forcing move seems maybe could seem to some of you as slightly suspect. Um, I wonder if you can guess the next forcing move that Hans Berliner plays here and he's, he's prepared this months before the game by the way. <laughs> so um, okay if I give you 10 seconds what would you play here as black if you wanted another forcing move? Okay Bishop g4 and so it's a little bit of a surprise already because there's already a knight on praise and now white plays an ugly looking move granted but uh, it does leave now two pieces attacked on praise. What does black do about this? And here we have it. We have a startling idea uncorked in this correspondence game and even at the very leisurely place, pace that correspondence chess offers it's going to be difficult for a player if he's, if he's faced with this first time without theoretical preparation uh, to handle the complexity of this next move. I wonder if you can guess <laughs> what was played in this position by black if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay. Both pieces now refuse to move away. Not just the knight, which was annoying, but now the bishop is also annoyingly just not not moving anywhere, because black plays e4, leaving both pieces on pre. Okay, on pre's. So, what does what does uh, white want to take first? What does he want to do something else? Well, he takes. The knight here, of course we need to examine taking the bishop and this is something incredibly obvious about taking the bishop being a disaster but we'll, in the game c takes d4 was played which looks reasonable and okay thanks very much give him a knight but now black plays bishop d6 refusing to move the bishop and threatening bishop takes g3 with a standard like pin tactic to win material so that looks a bit dangerous. But what about the knight that has been munched? Isn't isn't this pawn now on? Well, in fact, okay, it is taken. The pawn is taken because it does facilitate white potentially castling, which intuitively you might think is a really good idea because then you can solve the problem of the g3 knight being pinned. You know, bishop g3. If you can castle, it would seem intuitively a very good idea to do this. So we see here king d8 and there's a big debate now in this position um, ongoing. You know, is casting the best move or is, is there any other alternatives? The knight on d4 was also preventing some other moves. The monster knight on d4 was pre preventing for example queen b3 as a resource but here you know, queen b3 needs to be checked out. We'll leave that for the second pass. White castled which um, immediately obviously it, it seems intuitively to solve many problems. So white to piece up, can black really justify this? This peace sacrifice? Well he plays e takes f3. Now white the a piece up and its correspondence 
doesn't mind the potential of an exchange stack just to try and get rid of Black's counterplay. Um, so the exchange stack he offers um, obviously also takes takes his threatening mate anyway, so it'll at least be a draw. So this move looks very very logical. F2 check is threatened as well, winning the queen. So this move looks entirely logical to play rook takes f3. Okay. Now it might seem tempting uh, to to take this and maybe grab d4, but actually that that wasn't um, the idea here just yet. Black plays rook b8, so piece down, just playing the move rook b8. White is a little bit underdeveloped, you can see on the queen side, and this double pawn looks a little bit potentially unhealthy. But white plays bishop e2, okay, and now the exchange sack is taken, which is on offer. It's taken where bishop takes f3, bishop takes f3, and now queen takes d4, check, king h1. So what what has black got now? Well, black has equaled on pawns clearly, equal on pawns, five each. Uh, white has five, and still though, a piece down. But uh, was there some mag magic associated with with the rook to b8? Is that is that potentially an attacking piece? This is this is one of the the finer points here that the forcing move bishop takes g3 does wrench open the sensitive h file. Remember the queen's now sitting on on this diagonal, so this h file is a bit of a danger point now because after h takes g3 black has rook b6 all of these pieces sitting at bay at the moment and now rook b6 threatens extermination of the white king so something has to be done about that the intuitive move to stop that is d3 just eyeing h6 okay so Still, black's a piece down. It's correspondence. Is it a good idea to be a piece down in correspondence chess? Well, we see the move now. Knight e3, which interferes with the bishop eyeing h6. And now rook h6 is renewed as a threat. The king really doesn't want to go into this kind of thing with knight g4, etc. Also, the queen is attacked. So, the move played seems fair enough. Bishop takes e3. Queen takes e3, and now a more artificial type of defence needs to be constructed against this imminent threat of rook h6 check. And the move played is bishop g4, which seems elegant enough to play bishop h3 if rook h6. But rook h6 might not be worth it now. You know, maybe the rook wants the option of taking on b2 or doing something else. In fact, the move h5 is played, driving the bishop to h3. Now the bishop's influence here on h3 seems a bit restricted, seems a bit uh, of a single responsibility across that diagonal and it's also a bit squashable with this next move. Black is celebrating that these two pieces are still at bay, just under the left, and plays g5 threatening to squash the bishop with g4. Now white, of course, is, is very keen to get developed and, and uh, if necessary, give back material uh, to reach, you know, a good position here. And if he tries moving this bishop again, intuitively we could see that um, something like h4 could be very, very dangerous. In fact, probably forced mate or something like that. So he plays knight d4, not minding the bishop being squashed by Hans Berlin with g4. And he's also got knight c4 up his sleeve as well. Okay. So queen takes g3. And we're going to transition into an end game now. Knight takes b6. G takes h3, threatens mate. Now white parries this with queen f3, and the queens come off. And so after hg, king g1 is impossible, queen f3, so the queens have to come off. Queen takes g2, attacking the queen here. Okay, queen takes g2, king takes. 
C takes, and now we get a different tempo of the game. The final third part of the symphony of this game, in fact. There's a hev heavy, heavy analysis of this game and 63 other masterpieces of correspondence style chess in Tim Harding's excellent book, 64 Great Chess Games, if you are fascinated by this game so far. But um, this Rook and Pawn ending is very interesting now. So what is going on here? Black, after all that, after all that months of preparation, uncorking the novelty, White impressively giving back uh, a lot of pieces to try and maybe get a draw from this position. Okay, so can Black actually win this? Well, this is a correspondence chess and game, so you expect high precision. And both players being IM of IMs of over the board before computers, 1965. So what's White's first move? He plays Rook F1. Fair enough. Now King E7 to protect the pawn. Check. And now King D6. So is the King's active placement going to be very useful here compared to the White King? Does the White King have to stay on duty for this past pawn here? Rook F1 again. Now, if this Rook is tied up for defending uh, this pawn, can White for example, play rook f5. We need to investigate that to stop the king from crossing. Or is there something else? Or just rook h1, perpetual attack on, on the pawn. Black actually plays here. Maybe this is like, it's like a problem-like rook and pawn ending. Black is willing to give up the f7 pawn with this next move, rook c8. Okay. So it's taken, and now we're dead equal on pawns at the moment. And rook c2, there's rook f2. So this wasn't the idea to play here, uh, rook c2. It's said rook c7. Now, if we get a liquidation here, the black king is going to get this pawn after this, this king goes after that pawn. It will be lost. That transition will be completely lost. King and pawn ending. So white really can't take the rook. I believe so. Plays rook f2, and now all we have here for black is really, well, an outside pass pawn and a more active king. He, he makes his king more active, king, king e5, but it's coming dangerously to this d3 pawn. a4 is played here, and what's the idea? The idea is to try and bl break up, even sacrificially, blacks pawns to make sure they're not going to be connected past pawns soon. King d4, we see a5 just sacrificially breaking up, trying to break up all of those pawns, offering two pawns at the same time. So king takes d3 is chosen, check, king c2, and this b pawn is preserved for the moment with b4, b5. White plays now a6, trying to maybe get in rook f5 without any defense of a6. We see now black playing rook c4, which may offer kind of weakness of the last move for attacking a7, which is pounced on with rook f7. Rook takes b4, but White doesn't take the a7 pawn here. He actually just plays rook b7. But we see check. And now b4. And here, white plays rook takes a7. Black plays b3. And white feels it's time to resign now. Okay, so. It is a very, very complex correspondence game with tons of analysis done before the game and a lot of debates going on about the soundness of the early opening sacrifice. I think in this second pass we need to flip the board over to take Hans Berliner's, Hans Berliner's perspective. So this is something he had specially prepared against Jakob Estrin. 
Okay, so the the two knights defense, the fried liver. D five. Okay. Is chosen and now. This move B five. Very interesting. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail here for those interested, even in just the theory of this. Okay, so let's let's uh, see how we go. If bishop takes b5, I've had beautiful games, I think, with queen d5. Black's already, from an engine point of view, has great fun here. You know, whatever option, it's it's not too hot. If knight c3, queen g2, taking black's okay. There's always this diagonal, it's a bit weakened. Um, okay, so let's go back here. And if bishop takes c6, there's a nice compensation on the diagonal. So that's one of the points of this, this system. That um black has some nice play here with this battery all ready to go on the diagonal. But um okay. So let's go let's go back. Okay, in this position, bishop f1 was chosen. Also, also, you know, D takes C six. You might be wondering. B takes. I think this is okay for Black. Black has the bishop pair here. Okay, so in the game, um, Bishop F one. Okay. So now, if Queen takes D five, then the idea is to play Knight C three. You've got G two protected, and this this is fine for White. Bishop takes B five. That's not very nice for Black. This position. And if knight takes d5, we just said we said we explore. Bishop takes b5 now is is good. So forcing this capture from the knight, and this bishop takes b5. And now here with g5 actually on d4 protecting is a powerful move. For example, this position And what it's doing nicely here with knight h4 is actually a weakened diagonal here as well. Try and use, and the center might be good for white here as well after c4. So that's pleasant enough for white. So that's that's not nice. That's not what black really wants. So um, okay. So basically, after bishop f1. We get this move knight d4, and the knight is not going anywhere for a while after this. It's holding on to b5 here. We see a massively amazing conception after c3. Okay, knight takes d5, counterattacks this knight for the moment. White does have the option of c takes d4, though, as well as knight e4. If c takes d4, Mentioned queen takes g5. Let's go with this check. Queen f3 here. Not 100% sure if this is like best play from black, but um, this position seems reasonable. Okay, but uh, was there anything even more powerful? Well, queen takes g4 virtually, well, absolutely forced. King d8 is the most sensible. So this is all forced so far here, actually. Bishop b7 does seem the most sensible. e takes d4 might be an improvement, protecting the knight like with the queen. Okay. So e takes d4, protecting d5 with the queen. And if bishop c6, let's go with this. Knight f4, bishop takes a8. This is very, very interesting. Now bishop a6 here. <laughs> and, and white's king is stuck in the center. And black's king actually looks a bit safe here. So this might actually be really nice for black. Queen e5, now it seems to threaten f5, as well as other things. Oh, 
Well, this variation shows that uh, you know black seems to be doing okay. The advantage is minimal here uh, for white. Okay, so let's let's go back. So knight e4 was chosen to defend that knight to so just move it to e4. It seems fair enough. And we see queen h4 it being attacked again from the queen. Now knight g3 was played. If d3, well bishop g4 again, bishop g4, and it's nicer than the game potentially. So knight g3, and we saw bishop g4, f3, and the engine's giving this at a certain depth, as though white could be better. And this move e4 isn't mentioned, so it's quite a brilliant uh, bit of research, this e4 move. If if you look at this e4 move, um, you consider and you consider uh, the options for white, you know, taking either piece, and the associated implication of this pawn being loose. But then um, the depth of it for for seeing how when when this pawn is taken, this rook can come in like this. It is quite staggering, really. Okay, so we see e4. Engine doesn't like this. Thinks white's 1.59. It's coming down a bit. It's confusing position even for engines. Um, absolutely confusing, it seems. What happens after c takes d4? But let's rule out f takes g4. Why isn't f takes g4 the simpler one to try and rule out? Bishop d6. If it's forcing a move like king f2, it doesn't look too healthy. If king f2 isn't played, okay, let's go check. Well, there's knight takes b5 here. Castles. Black can castle here. And it's about equal, apparently. It's uh, because I think there's this mechanism here of check and bishop d6, which is really annoying for white. So that'd be almost like a virtual perpetual check. So let, let's go back to e4. So instead, c takes d4 was played. And okay, so the conception begins. Bishop d6. Bishop takes b5 check. And here, uh, instead of castling, uh, was there any other alternatives in this particular position? I might have got this totally wrong in the first pass with queen b3. I think queen b3 maybe just is just terrible, or is it? It's not entirely terrible. Bishop takes g3 because the idea can now be king d1 and d5 is attacked and g4 is attacked. And if bishop e6, bishop c6, e takes. Interesting stuff. Bishop takes g5. Bishop takes g f takes g2. And the bishop's holding on to h1 here. Queen takes g3. Queen takes h takes. Bishop takes rook g1. And the engine gives a slight advantage uh, to white here. But there's there's published analysis where Estrin let the cat out of the bag with um, you know what he had prepared months before the game and this might not be the case at all about Queen B3. So let's have a look at what he actually proposed here against Queen B3. Okay. So Queen B3 With the knight uh, attacked on d5, okay. Now the engine was simply um, well. In in this position, it's not actually the position where there was an amazing novelty. Pardon me. So perhaps th that was fair enough. What we just saw, white white castles. And it's here actually after e takes f3 with in this position where there was 
a very very interesting option to rook takes f3 which the engine was initially liking it's mentioning queen e1 but let's look at queen b3 here does black have anything really good you see this knight b4 I think you might be able to see the knight b4 there a little bit but let's put that in because this is part of the analysis knight b4 in Berliner's analysis has given a double exclamation mark so what's the idea for example queen takes f7 okay in this position f takes g2 let's go with f takes g2 rook f4 looks like a very powerful move And it looks as though white's doing okay here, rook f4. Interesting. Because in in the analysis by Estrian, after knight b4 here, um, we didn't see, um, well, he has rook takes f3. Let's go with this. c6. And in his analysis, this is before computers, he has bishop e2, and the engine has that as a belt equal. If bishop takes c6, knight takes queen b7. Bishop takes f3 will be winning for black. Uh, let's give an example. So say takes bishop takes g3. This 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 is all very nice for black. And then rook b8. It's it's all very nice. But um actually uh, this knight b4. Okay, let's look at rook takes f3 c6. Instead of bishop e2, the engine's crying out for rook e3 as a move here. Which might actually be, I don't know, it might actually be a refutation of this this analysis which was carried out by Berlina. So what is going on after rook e3? This is crazy. C takes b5. Knight c3. Okay, let's go with a6. a3. Bishop b6. Well, white seems to be doing very nicely. So, uh, okay, may maybe the, you know the resources for both sides here, and um, so even in, in rook takes f3, it looks it looks quite interesting. But um, okay, so queen takes f7 or rook takes f3 is interesting. Okay, let's go back to the game. Rook takes f3. Rook b8 was played. The engine is still liking white here with bishop f1. But bishop e2 was played, which might be an inaccuracy actually. On bishop f1, why why would that be a major improvement? Let's go with bishop takes f3. Takes check. here doesn't look so dangerous as the game queen takes rook b6 rook f6 okay maybe okay knight f4 I think I think black still got play though 
He's got play through the center as well, so that looks about equal now. So okay, we saw bishop e2, and um, now the engine is slightly liking black. So bishop takes f3, taking on d4, and this concept for bishop takes g3 is unveiled for rook b6, and it looks as though at least black is is equal now after this tactical storm. Um, so, and we get this now uh, rook and pawn ending transition after knight e3, bishop g4 trying to shield off that h file, wisely giving the bishop back up. Um, if bishop f5, I think that would just be a disaster with h4. So here, if g4, h3 is just crushing, rook takes b2, queen f2, end of game. It's not really nice at all. So white has to give back the bishop, so he lets it be squashed. Knight c4, and we get this, this final stage of the game, this, this rook and pawn ending. Okay, so this rook and pawn ending transition slightly favouring black, extra pawn at the moment, and he sacrifices the extra pawn to get this position with a slightly more active king, and white's playing dynamically as well, trying to fracture black's pawns. Black is keeping his b pawn intact for a moment, and here, I mean, the precision needed now to win this is it's very delicate. So rook takes b4 was played. Okay, we see the immediate rook a7 instead of what was played rook b7, but still, black seems to have the better of it now. In fact, that's that's a clear. It looks like a clear knockout after rook g4 there. B4. Well, that was the game continuation here. Uh, so if rook takes a7 as a as a try immediately. Okay, four. Now a seven. I think to table bases will have the answers here. Rook a three. I think it's. Um, I assume it's still winning for black. Uh, because of these two pawns here, but um, okay. So white played it um, in such a way that it was it was much more clear cut that black was winning here now after b3. Okay, uh, white resigned. If you want a, a fuller analysis of this game, I, as I, as I mentioned, uh, please check out 64 Great Chess Games by Tim Harding. It's uh, all correspondence games. So this 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 was a huge game uh, to cover, very very complex, and a very very complex innovation against who was at the time he was you know he was the exponent of the, of this line. So it was all prepared against the exponent to play this this stunner, e4. Um, I hope you got something from it, okay. And if you want to try a casual correspondence chess, of course try my site out chess chessworld.net www.chessworld.net. Um, but um, computers not allowed on my site. Um, this this game was before the advent of very powerful computers. Um, so yeah, correspondence does offer, it seems, and traditionally, you know, a vast platform for intense chess analysis and the most detailed, intricate games. Uh, you'd never really get this level of analysis and preparation in over the board chess. Okay. And it was in this tournament, I believe, that um, Hans Berliner won uh, the tournament and to become the fifth ICCF World Chess Champion between 1965 and 1968. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.